So um, thanks for coming. Um, this talk I think will be kind of amusing. Anybody uh, seen some of my other talks, you might recognize some familiar themes. Um, I like to take on things that are a little bit controversial from time to time, and I think this might be one of them. Okay, so um, how did I get here with this uh, title, SWR, who cares? Well, I do this 9 a.m. talk net um, on Fridays on the net control. We have it uh, five days a week, and people ask me all sorts of technical questions. I'm on, on the net control on Friday, and one of the things that comes up often is SWR. Now, Let's see if you all know what SWR is. Um, is it a breakfast cereal? <laughs> no. Uh, how about a floor polish? No. It's uh, maybe a way to just say slower. <laughs> uh, a, an obsessive compulsive disorder? Well, this may be true to some degree, right? <laughs> Uh, but uh, what it really stands for is standing wave ratio, and uh, we'll do a little bit more later about uh, what that means. Um, we're going to take a little trip through some wave mechanics and some other fun stuff. So I hope you will uh, enjoy taking a ride with me through a little bit of science. Now, we all know that guy, right? 1.12 to 1. Oh no, my whole station is unusable. I have to go out and retune it. Take the antennas down. There's something clearly wrong, right? Um, the other thing you hear a lot is resonance is one-to-one, -one, right? We've all heard that, except for that's not really true. And then there's the whole power is wasted thing. Uh, and that's uh, something we can have a discussion about because sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't, or sometimes it's marginal enough that you don't care. And then you have people that just say, you know, I, I have talked with people about this all the time and they, and I, I get done with my spiel, and then they say, but I just feel better when it's one-to-one. -one. <laughs> okay, you know, whatever floats your boat. Um, so uh, this talk is sort of like and sort of unlike Ground as a Myth. Anybody here seen Ground as a Myth? A few people? Yeah, okay. Um, so there's many misconceptions about SWR, as there are about ground, too. Uh, but in the case of SWR, there is, in fact, a clear definition and there is actually value to it. I always found ground to be not valuable. If anything, it muddied the waters. But um, SWR, I think, has some value, but we have to understand how to apply it and, and uh, where. So let's dig into this with a little more depth. Um, we're going to look at a little bit of wave mechanics and see what, how we calculate SWR and figure out what we're really measuring and what we should care about, which is the most important thing, right? So anybody here care about SWR? we got a few, okay. Well, maybe you'll care a little less, or more, we'll see. <laughs> so let's start with wave mechanics, and uh, if you took a little physics in high school or perhaps college, you've uh, studied this a little bit. Um, but I'm gonna talk about it in very general terms, and in fact, we're not gonna talk about RF for a little bit. So wave mechanics is the study of disturbances in, in some field. And so, oh, I hear a phone. Um, so the, the, the field gets a perturbation, that perturbation may propagate through the field, and uh, in a lot of cases it's an oscillation. So we're going to talk about sinusoidal perturbations a fair amount, although we will, we'll talk about some kind of pulse type ones as well. And waves can be in any kind of field, really. They can be mechanical waves, they can be electrical waves, they can even be uh, uh, quantum and gravity. But we're going to stick to mechanical and electrical here. Now, wave motion in the sinusoidal case is defined as simple harmonic motion. These are the uh, equations of that motion. It's very simple equations. You know, A sine omega t plus some phase shift, which is phi. And omega is the, the, the um, radian frequency. So it's, you know, two pi, one trip around a cycle. And of course, we all know about wavelength and we can calculate that from the speed of light. Um, and uh, when we really study this more deeply, we use complex numbers, and the equation on the bottom is the complex version of all of that that accounts for uh, things that are sort of unseen in the motion. Now, in mechanical waves, we can kind of understand things better because the waves propagate slowly. Anybody ever seen one of these shive wave machines? They're really cool. I, I actually looked around to see if I could buy one, but they're kind of unobtainium right now. But you can also try this at home if you have a rope. And I couldn't find a piece of rope that I was satisfied with that exhibited the properties I wanted to show. But if you can take a rope and kind of shake it, you can make waves and they'll propagate along the road. And uh, 
you can actually watch the stuff happen. And I remember back at MIT, they had uh, in 26100, if you know that room, they had, <laughs> they had this big shy wave machine, you remember? <laughs> yeah, it was really cool. Although I never saw it in use. Now, traveling waves. We've heard about traveling waves, and this is, uh, let's see if I can get this to go here. Oops, no, sorry. Oops, go back. All right, traveling waves. There we go. There's a traveling wave. So maybe you've heard of traveling wave tubes, but traveling waves are a kind of wave propagation where the, um, the waves kind of travel across in time like this. So they don't have a fixed position right there. Um, so this is for an impedance match situation. You can match impedances mechanically too. Uh, it's just a little bit of a different set of parameters that you look at, but all the points are kind of changing. And there's, if you look at the envelope of the whole thing, it's really flat. Um, so we don't see anything interesting happen there except the waves just go like that. When that means that all the energy is getting from uh, left to right in that picture and finding its way somewhere else. A really important property of waves is that they can uh, be superposed on one another. And that means it's a linear system, so they kind of just add. And uh, let's see, if we do this, you should be able to see two little bumps. And you see they kind of go together and then they recede from each other in the opposite direction, or it just kind of appears that way. But they get added in the middle and are unchanged by the interaction with each other. And that's what we mean by superposition. So they overlay on one another. And what you see is addition and subtraction. And the reason I want you to know about this is because you can see an interesting phenomena here on the bottom where we have one fixed sine wave and another one that's changing phase as it goes. And if you look at the resultant waveform, you can see it kind of goes up and down a whole lot. And that up and downness is what we'll get to when we talk about SWR. So you have addition and subtraction that makes it really big and sometimes makes it really small. Now, I prefer to think about a lot of this stuff with boundary conditions. And so the boundary conditions constrain things. If you think about like a dipole, at the ends of the dipole where the wire is just hanging in space, the impedance is going to be really high, which means you'll be dominating, voltage will dominate, not much current flowing there. But um, if you're near the feed point, then it's going to be mostly current and not much voltage. So those are the boundary conditions. They show us kind of what obtains at the ends of the wire. From that, we can learn about the system. And the same thing is true in a mechanical system. If you have a rope like this, and you have a, uh, a pulse that propagates down, and in this case, the end of the rope is not constrained, you see that you get a lot of deflection. And the deflection goes up. And the energy has to go somewhere, so there's like a wall over there. And so that energy comes back, and you see it comes back in the same uh, direction of deflection. But if you instead constrain the rope so that it can't move like this, you'll see that it actually flips over like that. And that's just conservation of energy and momentum right there, making sure that nothing goes away. I mean, the rope does heat up a little bit, so energy is still conserved. It's just not all that stays in the system. But in an idealized system, this is what it would look like. And from things like that, there's a lot of intermediate points we can look at. And we can work back from these boundary conditions and understand what's going on. And what we have here is an example of a discontinuity. So we have a thicker piece of rope and a thinner piece of rope. And if we send the pulse down the rope, you can see it changes when it hits that boundary. Part of that energy continues forward, but part of it looks like it's being held in place because it's a thicker rope. So part of it flips over and comes back the other way. And vice versa, if you look at the bottom one, you'll see that um, we go from a thicker piece of rope to a thinner piece of rope, and you can see that you get a uh, same polarity pulse propagating forward. Because uh, in that case, we have mostly uh, tension and not much deflection. And that manages to transfer some energy there. But not all the energy. It doesn't get perfectly transferred, so it starts coming back. Now, whenever we have a mismatch, we get standing waves, and we can get standing mechanical waves, too. So in this case, we'll have two sinusoids that are moving in opposite directions to one another. So that represents some energy traveling this way and some traveling back towards us. And you'll see that we get this interesting pattern that seems stationary, 
And if you look at the envelope of this pattern, you'll see that it's going up and down. We have peaks and troughs as the two signals move past each other. And there's nothing magic going on here. We're just adding them together, adding and subtracting for when it's below the x-axis. So we have this incident and reflected wave. They interact, and we get this pattern like this. And this is what gives you so-called standing waves, because those waves don't appear to be moving left to right. They just create peaks and valleys. So this is how we get to things like standing wave ratio. So uh, that's the ratio of the peak to the trough of the envelope, not the uh, actual instantaneous signal. The instantaneous signal will be at a certain level, but you'll find that uh, the envelope changes as you move down, as you move down the medium, for example. And this, of course, applies to mechanical waves. These are the equations of that. It's pretty simple. The z's in there are the impedance, and z naught is what's called the characteristic impedance, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, and you get this number uh, gamma, which is the, the reflection coefficient. And from that, we take the absolute value of that. It's actually a vector. And um, come up with the swir, the v swir. So um, that gives you an idea of how we get from sort of mechanical waves or electrical waves into a thing call, that we call standing wave ratio. Now we have a, a thing, a characteristic impedance. Any system that has waves propagating in it has a characteristic impedance. And I found this uh, cool animation on YouTube, which I sliced a little piece out of. Um, it's actually the ratio of two parameters. And um, in the case of a piece of rope, it would be the deflection and the tension in the rope. And uh, you, it's roughly constant in the medium, or at least we're going to make that assumption that we don't have any discontinuities just for purposes of this short discussion. And electrically, it kind of looks like that. We have capacitors and inductors. And if you know anything about them, they're energy storage devices. So some of the energy flows into an inductor, gets stored up in the magnetic field there. Some of that gets transferred into the electric field in the capacitor. And then that gets transferred into the magnetic field in the next segment. And on it goes. And here's a little video that uh, shows you that. Hopefully it plays. There you go. So this is just an analogy. It's not exactly how it happens, of course. But you can see uh, as if the voltage is being lifted up on the capacitors and propagating down the transmission line like that. So it comes down. And at the end, it probably meets an uh, unmatched uh, segment. So the energy can't be transferred out of the system. And so it, some of it kind of comes back. But you get the idea. And um, just to show you that there is uh, some, something like a match in a uh, mechanical system, I'm going to show you a little video of a Scheib wave machine, which I found that has a perfectly matched, well, almost perfectly matched uh, segment down at the end. I think they have a little damper on it that uh, makes the matching. So the matching can come out in many different ways. So if you, you know, you know sometimes we have dummy loads, right? It's a 50 ohm resistor. And that matches this characteristic impedance and then takes all the energy and turns it into heat at the very end. But it doesn't have to be turned into heat. It can be turned into more propagation down another piece of feed line. It can be turned into energy that gets transferred into the antenna, which then gets transferred into space time. So this is the idea. Um, and you know we, we have this force times distance thing working in the mechanical system, which is the, the work, the mechanical work that's done on the system. And then that is actually becomes energy. That's the work energy theorem. But let's take a look at this. It's kind of cool. So you see the waves. This is in slow motion. And they propagate down the end. And watch as it hits the end there. You see it deflect. But you don't see significant amounts of energy propagating back. And that's because the energy was almost perfectly transferred out of the system and turned into heat. OK, so that's what a match is. A match is some situation where the energy that's propagating down the feed line manages to encounter something that can perfectly transfer it into something. We don't know what, but transfer it. So I've been talking about ropes and, and dampers and things like that. And you're probably saying about now, well, this isn't ham radio. What's she doing here? She should be at some other conference. Um, but I, it really is. So you can think of the deflection of these mechanical systems, so the rope systems, as uh, voltage or the electric field component. 
and the tension on the rope as the current or the magnetic field. They have similar constraints, they have different sort of characteristic impedances of space-time uh, and uh, the media that it's in, but it's the same sort of thing. It's not, and, and I wrote this a great analogy, but it's more than an analogy, it's actually the same principles at work, uh, only in a mechanical system. And you can see the same kinds of behavior if you have shorted and open. So you have a shorted transmission line, you get that flip in voltage and it comes back the other way with the same amount of energy. Uh, you have an open transmission line, uh, you get, the, uh, you get the, the same voltage coming back without the flip. But, so it works really well. In coax, we get waves propagating in the same fashion. It's a, sort of like the rope, only it has more dimensions and a different uh, field that it's propagating through. So it's electric and magnetic fields in this case. Same principles, um, all the energy is moving in the space in the coax, not in the wire very much. So most of it is in the fields that are traveling inside the coax. And coax has a characteristic impedance, which we know, right? 50 ohms, typically for ham stuff, but it doesn't have to be. Um, but it's the same notion. Um, we can see the same thing in open feed line. It usually has a different characteristic impedance because the conductors are at a different length and the field shapes are different. Um, in the, this case, it's very easy to measure. We can actually take an LED and a loop or just an LED with, um, that senses the electric field and just move down the thing, move down the feed line and we'll see the energy right off of the feed line because it leaks a bit. Now, the way we look at some of this stuff is to examine a thing called the Smith chart. Anybody heard of one of these? Anybody have one at home? Anybody actually use one? All right, we got a few out there. Okay, so Smith charts are really cool. They're a little bit difficult to grasp at first, but they're not that hard. Um, it's a way to, that we can kind of, it's, it's like a circular slide rule of sorts. So we can estimate impedance. Um, so we're, we can use SWR as one input um, and the really interesting thing is that it works for any system impedance. It doesn't matter um, and it's actually a, a conformal map of the reflection coefficient which means that all the angles are the same inside this map as it were, if it's at, at the same as if it were on a big plane. So taking a look at the Smith chart we have this thing uh, you see it's, it's actually in the complex plane and the center is called the prime center and it's usually labeled 1.0 um, and we have resistant circles. So those are the ones that are centered on the right hand side. So we've got these circles that get bigger and bigger on the right hand side and then we have these reactance curves that come out and look like a flower like that. So those are the reactance curves and then on top of that uh, we overlay the two so we have the resistance circles and the reactance curves and they intersect and where they intersect is an impedance you can measure. So you can say it's this many ohms, J, this much reactance. And that's a complex number. So when you measure your uh, antenna feed point impedance or something like that, you can place a point on this uh, Smith chart and then make some sense of it. And then we overlay another set of circles, which are the constant SWR circles on top of that. So that allows you to see uh, SWR. And, when you're perfectly matched, the circle's radius is zero. So it's right on the prime center there. So to find SWR with the Smith chart, we start with some impedance. We scale it. So if it's 1.0, we say, well, if it's a 50 ohm system, that's 50 ohms. If it's a 75 ohm system, we say that's 75 ohms. And we plot a point scaling the complex components uh, appropriately. And we can make a, cent a circle centered at that um, 1.0, the prime center, and that circle is the SWR circle for the system. And the radius, um, uh, it, basically the, the reflection coefficient is the radius. And what we find out is that as we move around that circle, all of those impedances that we encounter, and there's an infinite number of them, are included in that as a standing wave ratio. So it's just a matter of rotating. rotating. Rotation represents moving down the transmission line. And if you've ever noticed, sometimes uh, you have a mismatched antenna or something like that, and you add a segment of transmission line and suddenly you can tune it, that's because you've moved around that circle and changed the impedance to one that the matching network can deal with a little better. Um, but really, you've just moved on the Smith chart like that. And the SWR intersects on the right-hand side of prime center. So you can read the SWR right off of the scale there on the right-hand side. 
If you want to find impedances, the same sort of thing. You just flip it around a little bit. So you start with the SWR and plot that point and you have um, the, the, then you draw a circle around the prime center and that shows you the kind of impedances you're going to encounter as you move down the transmission line. So it's the same thing, but who cares? <laughs> I mean, really. Um, well, I'll tell you a couple reasons to care about this. SWR is degenerate, and by that I mean that there's an infinite number of points that represent each SWR in a system. So if you have, if I remember off the top of my head, I think something like 15 ohms and 150 ohms is about a 3 to 1 in, uh, in a 50 ohm system. They're both, uh, the, they're both the same SWR. So there's all these different values and all the complex values between them are all the same. So when you say I have an SWR of 1.3 to 1, you're telling me something, but you're not telling me a whole lot about the system. You're telling me you're on that circle somewhere, but I have no idea where you are. And of course the math actually you know, gets rid of a lot of information and throws it away. So SWR really has a lot of information taken out of it. Another thing we can observe about this is that the absolute load doesn't matter. So you have um, the, uh, the load is 50 ohms, we normalize it on the Smith chart, and we say that's 1.0, but who cares? It could be 75 ohms, it could be 150, it could be 300 or 6,000. It doesn't matter. Uh, we just scale it appropriately, so it's all linear that way. And the exact same wave mechanics apply. So if I have a 300 ohm system, and a 50 ohm system, the wave mechanics are identical. It's just the numbers are a little bit different, but that's it. And all we're trying to do is propagate energy in one form or another down this transmission line efficiently. So we propagate that, we turn some into heat, or we turn all of the, in, the resultant energy into heat, or into mechanical motion, or propagating fields, which is what we care about as hams. Now, up until this point, we haven't talked much about how we get the energy into a transmission line. Well, in uh, the ham world, well, and usually people call this the generator. In the ham world, we call it a transmitter. I think you guys have heard about those, right? You may have one or two. Um, and this is my FT100 that I rescued off of eBay and turned into a working radio again. That was an exciting uh, project. But um, you, you have to think about what the equivalent circuit of this generator is. Um, and we try to make simplified equivalent circuits. And keep in mind as we talk about this that somebody has designed this thing for a particular system impedance. So um, the transistor radios are typically designed for hammers anyway, but for 50 ohm systems. Um, tube uh, devices might be designed for something completely different. They're actually kind of variable. They ha actually have a tuning network on the, on the output so that you can tune them up to a number of different system impedances. But, the real key here is delivering power. That's what we're after. Now, this thing always bugs me. Anybody ever heard of the maximum power transfer theorem? Yeah, yeah. it's almost always misapplied and it drives me nuts. So it goes something like this. Um, for a load impedance and a source impedance, match the two impedances for maximum power transfer. Well, I left something really important out there. And that is that this is not symmetric. There is an assumption that the source impedance is a fixed value and you have to adjust the load to get that to match. It doesn't mean that you should split the two if you can choose. And I'll show you an example of that. So here's a degenerate case. We have, I want to get maximum power into a 50 ohm load. So let's assume RL is a 50 ohm load. And I can change the source impedance this time, not the load impedance. So we'll assume that the source voltage is 50 volts, okay? We'll apply Ohm's law, we'll make the source impedance 50 ohms, so we did the maximum power transfer theorem, right? 50 and 50. Here's the calculation, you get 12.5 watts on the load. But what if I just made the source impedance zero? If I make it zero, I can get 50 watts into that resistor. And so you can see how if you just blindly applied the maximum power transfer theorem without thinking about this assumption that you can't change the source impedance, you'll make incorrect decisions. And I see this all the time. And uh, for people, who, especially if you're not familiar with how things are designed like this. And so there's this strange assumption that since the transmitter's source impedance or its, uh, its uh, sort of its design impedance is 50 ohms, 
That must mean there's a 50 ohm resistor in there somewhere to match it. But no, there's no such thing. Um, the transmitter looks a lot more like a voltage source, which would have zero source impedance. It's actually quite complex because the transistors have strange impedances. They change through the cycle. You've got inductors in there, transformers, all sorts of stuff making that really complicated. But the whole idea is that there's some kind of conjugate matching network to match it up to be happy with 50 ohms and get maximum energy out. But there's no 50 ohm resistor in there anywhere. And what the transmitter is trying to do is just get the power from the power supply into the coax. But it's not necess it just wants to be happy with 50 ohms. So it's a desirable impedance. Whatever it's designed for, that's desirable. It keeps the transistors happy, keeps them in their safe operating area, keeps them cool because we don't want to dissipate a lot of power in those transistors, and keeps them linear, which is also important. As linear as we can get them, much easier to do with tubes than transistors. But these systems are often designed around this notion of a 50 ohm transmission line that I want to get push energy into. So don't think about it in terms of necessarily the maximum power transfer theorem or anything like that. We just want to have a happy match between the output devices and the transmission line. We haven't talked too much about transmission lines except in the theoretical sense, but the real world ones are not perfect. They have resistive loss and dielectric loss as well from the AC component, and they also have leakage loss and probably lots of other kinds of losses. But um, those are the three major ones. And what happens is when we have a high SWR that's a, that peaks and valleys, right? We have areas on the coax where we have high voltage and other areas where we have high current. So the current and voltage kind of flip around from each other. And that high voltage uh, can cause dielectric losses and the high current can cause resistive losses. So when we get losses, we get heat and that means we're not talking to somebody. You could take all that heat and turn it into a QSO. So we want to try and preserve that in a reasonable way. There's a couple of equations that help us look at loss in coax. Uh, coax compared to the open wire feeder we talked about earlier is, uh, is a much more lossy medium. But and it really depends on the coax type. There's lots of calculators on the internet. You can figure it out yourself. But the AWRL has a nice little uh, equation that might be in the handbook or the antenna book. I don't know which. But um, you basically take the, uh, the non-high SWIR loss ratio and you can turn that into a loss ratio for a given SWR. And this is the equation that's used to do that. It's pretty simple. Um, it's very easy to calculate that on a calculator, for example. And here's an example graph. Um, so this is some generic, this is straight from the ARL handbook, some generic piece of coax. Let's assume that it has 1 dB loss from A to B at 1 to 1 SWR. Well, what happens if it's 2 to 1 SWR? The additional loss is 0.2 decibels. That's not a lot. Um, even if it's 10 to 1, it's only 2.2 decibels on top of 1. So you've more than doubled the loss, but it's not a huge loss yet. And since we talk about the, the non swir loss, we're accounting for the length of the coax. But the point is here that even at a high SWR, you pay kind of a modest penalty sometimes, but it may be very significant for you, especially if you have a long run of coax. You have to make that decision. Transmitters, as we talked about, like this 50 ohm system impedance, and we want to match them into the load. We use matching networks to do this. Uh, uh, so we do a match to make the transmitter happy. We make some choices about where to match, and I just implied that as you go make the coax longer and longer, you pay a bit, or, a bit more of a penalty for the loss. So you have to make a decision where you do that match. You could do it near the transmitter, uh, which is a very convenient thing to do. I do it there because it's easy for me. Or you can do it up by the antenna, which is much more efficient. Um, and then you avoid the loss in the coax because you run the coax uh, at uh, a one-to-one -one match to its characteristic impedance. And you don't get that extra 2.2 dB if you had a 10-to-1 load, for example. Um, but it can be a pain to get the thing mounted out there and make sure it uh, has power and control signals and uh, stays dry. Matching networks, um, we use these to null out any reactants that's in there. It's a kind of a complex conjugate match uh, in complex space. So like if it looks capacitive, we stick an inductor in to make it look more inductive. And that kind of brings it back up on the real axis. But the whole idea is to transform 
this impedance into the pure resistance that ends up being the radiation resistance that ends up being the propagating fields, and that's what you want. Um, and of course, you want an efficient matching network. The most efficient net matching networks have components that are very efficient, like air gap capacitors and air inductors, usually those ferrites. Uh, they, they get kind of warm sometimes. Now, the antenna is the ultimate load, for us anyway, unless you really want to talk on a dummy load, which can be fun. I don't know if you've tried that, but I've done it. <laughs> um, so most antennas are not 50 ohms. Anybody aware of this? Yes, yes most antennas are not. Um, a free space dipole is 72 ohms. Um, a monopole is half of that, 36 ohms. Uh, any kind of Yagi is extremely low impedance and can be under 10 ohms. And uh, there's this kind of misconception that if uh, I have the proper antenna, I'll get a one-to-one -one SWR match because it's 50 ohms. But why should it be 50 ohms? We pulled 50 ohms out of a hat. You know, somebody just said, oh, this is a reasonable set of loss characteristics, but the coax isn't too big, so 50 ohms sounds good. But there's no reason the antenna should be at 50 ohms. Um, and you know, a lot of times when you find that you're off of these impedances, these design impedances, the pattern can be really weird. But um, if you have a dipole that's cut correctly and it's in free space, it's not gonna be 50 ohms. And usually if it matches at 50 ohms, there's loss going on. So uh, oftentimes you'll find, I like verticals if you saw my other talk yesterday, I really like vertical antennas for portable operation. And so um, you put the vertical antenna up and if you lay down a whole lot of radials, you'll find that uh, the system impedance goes way down and then it doesn't match well. And I can tell you a little story about this. Um, I was in uh, Los Angeles for a conference, I don't know, 15 years ago. And I brought the, my K2 with me and uh, uh, I think it was a Super Antennas MP1 and a whole pile of radials. And I got on top of a parking structure at the Anaheim Convention Center. And I laid out all these radials carefully, plugged in the rig, got the battery going, and the SWR was like three to one. And I heard Victor 55 Victor calling and calling. And I thought, I want to work Africa. <laughs> what am I gonna do? So what would you do in that situation? I'm sorry? Light Yeah, well all I did was turn the power down, to about 50 watts, and called and called and I worked the guy. And so I didn't care too much about the lousy SWR. The antenna worked reasonably well. I mean, that's anecdotal evidence, but certainly I was able to deliver reasonable power. My radio didn't get too hot. It didn't shut down. And, you know, I just worked the guy. So in that case, I believe that either there was uh, maybe some rebar in the, in the parking structure that was coupling to the radials making a really good ground plane and of course this was a center loaded antenna so its impedance is going to be way below 36 ohms so uh, the, the feed point impedance was probably quite low and the radio would just said I'm sad about this and I said I don't care I'll just turn the power down and you can operate so this was a, uh, a, a really important lesson in uh, not worrying too much about SWR so what do we really care about with all of this stuff? Uh, we want to make that transmitter happy. That's the most important thing. So matching efficiency, you don't want the finals to get uh, uh, hot or, or burn themselves out. So you want to make sure that that's a system impedance that it's quite reasonable to deal with. Um, and so you mess around with the matching efficiency. If you want to match it up, make sure you have a decent tuner. Um, account for the loss in the feed line. Make sure that you understand the trade-off. So if you have a short run of coax, like um, uh, my HF antenna is uh, 15 feet away and it often runs at a 10 to 1 SWR outside the tuner and uh, I don't care because it's 10 feet. What am I losing? Half a dB or a quarter of a dB? It's no big deal. But if you have a 100 foot run or 150 foot run, then you might want to think about it a little more and run the loss calculation, make sure that it all makes sense to you. So just do that and get out there on the radio and have some fun. If you want to learn more about this stuff, um, there's the ARL handbook, which has some nifty stuff in it about this. The antenna book is a great resource. Um, there's some good stuff about uh, SWR actually on Wikipedia, although it's incomplete. 
um, as is usually the case on Wikipedia, but you can pick up some of the relationships up there, the mathematical relationships. And uh, also you'll find any like second semester college physics text will have lots of stuff about wave mechanics in it. Uh, so use that as a resource as well. And so uh, uh, thank you.